The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the book of Genesis, chapter 26, and verses 17 and 18. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gera, and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. We return once more to this incident in the life and history of Isaac, the son of Abram, because, as I've been indicating, it seems to me to give us a very perfect picture and portrayal of the present uh, state and position of the Christian church. We are dealing with the whole subject of revival and the need of revival. And my suggestion is that we are very much today in the position that Isaac found himself when he was thus searching for a supply of water. He knew that it was to be found there in those old wells that had been dug by his father Abraham. But when he went to them, there was no sign of water, and that for the reason, as we are told here, that the Philistines had stopped the wells after the death of Abraham. And so it seems to me that there are certain hindrances and obstacles to revival. The history of revival shows this so clearly. And we are dealing with some of these hindrances and obstacles to revival. It surely is our first business. It is our first duty. Isaac digged again, which means that he cleared out the rubbish and the earth that had been thrown in by the Philistines. And that is our business. We don't just pray that that water may spring up through all this rubbish. It is our business to clear it out. God, we know, can work miracles, and he has often visited the church in spite of her appalling condition. But it is our business to work as well as to pray, and our first task is to deal with these hindrances. And we've been dividing them up like this. First of all, there are the hindrances uh, which we can describe under the heading of uh, error and apostasy, heresy, lack of orthodoxy. There are certain things which simply must believe, be believed. There is no history of revival in any church of any size or kind or in any place which has denied certain vital central doctrines in connection with redemption and salvation. So we've dealt with them. But then we came on to deal with a second group last Sunday morning, which I called defective orthodoxy, or if you prefer it, a kind of eccentric orthodoxy. A general orthodoxy, but because of a lack of balance in various respects, in the mind and understanding or in the spirit, because of this lack of balance and true conformity to the scriptural pattern, such an orthodoxy can indeed, in the end, be quite useless, a defective orthodoxy. And it is good that we should ponder that and continue to do so. But we come this morning to another step in this matter, which, alas, again, we have of necessity to consider. And I cannot think for a, of a better description of this than the term dead orthodoxy. And I suppose that the history of the church throughout the centuries indicates quite clearly that this, of all dangers, is perhaps the greatest danger, and certainly the greatest danger confronting many of us at the present time. I would imagine that this is the greatest danger confronting the individual who is evangelical in his outlook, as it is indeed the greatest danger confronting any church, any individual church or groups of churches that can be described as evangelical. It is an appalling thought, but it's nevertheless true that there is such a thing as dead orthodoxy. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, let us proceed with this painful analysis, and it is indeed painful, and yet it is essential. What are the manifestations of this condition? 
Well, first of all, I would suggest that we look at it more or less in general, as an attitude, as a general condition. And here, I think the word that uh, sums up this condition most perfectly is the word contentment. I hesitate to use the word smugness, but perhaps we could put the two together and say a smug contentment. Now, let us look at this. So what do I mean by this smug contentment? Well, I mean something like this. It's the condition of people who believe the truth and who know that they believe the truth. There's no question about that. You question them, you catechize them, and you'll find that they're correct and that they're orthodox. There's no fault to be found with their creed or with their belief. But I say there is this element of contentment about it. In this way, that... Uh, they not only believe these things, they are satisfied with themselves and self-satisfied. They are the people who believe the truth as over and against these others uh, who do not believe the truth and who are not uh, orthodox, these liberals and these people who used to be called modernists. Now, it is right, of course, to be orthodox and the others are wrong, but the way in which we look at ourselves can be so terribly bad. It can ruin even the correctness of our belief, if this element of smugness comes in, and of contentment, and of satisfaction. As uh, Job could not help saying to those friends who came to comfort him, no doubt ye are the people. Now it's that sort of attitude. You see it's so perfectly illustrated there in those friends of Job. Well, all they said was all right, but it was of no use to poor Job. Indeed, it was making his condition worse. And what he objected to in them was this very smug contentment which I'm trying to describe. And of course, another way in which it manifests itself is this. That in this attitude, uh, the main concern is of course uh, defensive. Being that we are right and are right as we are, well, well, the only thing we have to do therefore is to defend our position. So you will find that an individual or a church that is guilty of this state spends most of his or their time uh, purely on the defensive. What is called apologetics becomes very prominent. It becomes the main interest. Uh, the books which are published and uh, are read by such people are almost invariably apologetic, defending the position, you see. Now, uh, to me, this is a very serious and important matter. And if I were asked uh, to give an opinion on the state of evangelicalism, say, roughly for the last 80 years, I would say that this has been its greatest characteristic. It has withdrawn itself, as it were, and has erected uh, some kind of iron curtain or protective mechanism, and most of the energy has been given to defense, defense of the position, apologetics. And it's so pathetic to notice the way in which almost anything is clutched at and used, if any sort of man who is prominent in society uh, even hints vaguely that he believes the Christian faith, he is taken hold of at once, he becomes the great Christian. Rumors circulate as to profound spiritual experiences in the royal family and others. We are always defending the position, and that's the interest, the excitement, and the energy is given to that. It's a defensive and a negative attitude, and it is a part of this dead orthodoxy which is content simply with maintaining its own position. But then I could use another term that is used in the scripture to define this, and that is this condition of being at ease in Zion. You remember that word in the book of the prophet Amos? At ease in Zion. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, this is a description, it seems to me, of people who are anxious to have sufficient religion to make them feel safe, but who require nothing beyond that. They're out for safety. They want some kind of security. There is always, after all, that great fact of death in the distance and what lies beyond. So they want safety and security. And there are many people who become interested in religion for this one and only reason. They're not interested in the thing itself. They've got no real positive desire after God, but they've got this very definite negative interest in safety. These are the people whom we may describe as 
being interested in religion only as a kind of parachute. You never know when it may be needed. Accidents may take place. So it's very good to have this mechanism at hand. Ah, oh, but you mustn't spend the whole of your life. You mustn't be too serious, you mustn't be too concerned about this. Yes, but uh, it's good to have it. So while you give the main part of your life and of your interest to things that belong to this world, well, you just make this provision in case of need. Religion, I say, as a kind of parachute. Just enough religion to make us feel safe, but no more than that. And, of course, this leads in turn to something else. And I think you'll recognize the description as I go along. Such people are always very fond of what you may describe as general messages. They don't want anything too particular. They want a little general uplift. They, well, they want something that in general is going to help them. So what they like is something that's interesting. They are interested in general ideas. Religion, they feel, is a general outlook upon life. It's, it's good in and of itself, and uh, it does provide this element of safety. Yes, but uh, you don't want too much of it. So you, you confine yourself to, to general ideas and thoughts. You say, how interesting, how uplifting, and then quotations, of course, from literature. Oh, how beautiful and how wonderful it is. Now... I'm trying to give a description to you of what I would call late Victorian and Edwardian religion, speaking very generally, and alas, it has persisted. We've got our religion. We feel it's all right. Well, now, what do we do when we come together to God's house? Well, what we do is this. We, we don't uh, preach on the great doctrines of salvation. No, we're interested in character studies. Tremendously interesting. We take these Bible characters and... We go through them leisurely, and uh, how entertaining it is. It's, it's almost as good as a novel. Nothing to disturb us, of course. We are looking on at a man like Abraham, or looking on at a man like Isaac, and it's interesting to see these characters and their differences and so on. You look up the literature of the end of the last century and the beginning of this, and you'll find that there were endless books published just along that line. Character studies. Studies in this and that, this leisurely approach uh, to the Bible. And it's all so general and all so remote, all so interesting, far away from us. That has been the kind of thing that has been so common. But let me go on. Because next to this I must put of necessity this. A dislike of being searched and of being disturbed. It must always be general, I say. It must always be remote. It must always be uh, far away from us somewhere. It, it must never come too near to us. I've often quoted that statement of uh, Lord Melbourne, you remember, one of the prime ministers, last century Queen Victoria's first prime minister, who expressed all this so perfectly when he said, you know, he said, things have come to a pretty pass if religion's going to start being personal, now that's it. Religion is all right. It's something general. It's something there in the background, which is I'm going to turn to and make use of when I need it. But it, it, it mustn't disturb me. Oh, it's all in the Old Testament. The people cried out to the prophets and said, speak to us, smooth the things. You read your Old Testament and you'll find that the false prophets were always much more popular than the true prophets. Poor Jeremiah, how he suffered at their hands, and he wasn't the only one. Why were the false prophets so popular? Well, isn't it obvious their message was this? They said, peace, peace, when there is no peace. The, the charge brought against them is this, that they have healed the hurt of the affliction of the daughter of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. These preachers and prophets who gave people the impression that all was well with them, that they were God's people, that they'd got nothing to worry about. But the true prophet came and he searched and he probed and he condemned and he rebuked. And they said, who is this fellow? If I may say so in passing, the thing 
that has given me greatest pleasure and greatest encouragement of all the things I've ever been told that people say about my ministry is this. It was said by a lady who remonstrated and said, this man preaches to us as if we were sinners. Quite so. You see, you mustn't be searched. You mustn't be examined. You're all right. We're all right. Of course, denounce those sinners that are outside or those liberals. But why? We are the people. We are orthodox. And we, we don't need that. We need instruction. We want these general lectures, these addresses, these characters. To, how interesting. How, but we mustn't be disturbed. There's nothing wrong with us. And so such people, as you see everywhere in the Bible and in the history of the church, have always disliked anything that searches them or makes them feel uncomfortable or that probes them. And therefore I bring it finally to this point. There is nothing vital in the religion and in the worship of such people. They expect nothing and they get nothing and nothing happens to them. They go to God's house not with the idea of meeting with God, not with the idea of waiting upon him. It never crosses their minds or enters into their hearts that something may happen in a service. No, no. We always do this on Sunday morning. It's our custom. It's our habit. It's a right thing to do. But the idea that God may suddenly visit his people and descend upon them, the whole thrill of being in the presence of God and sensing his nearness and his power never enters their imaginations even. The whole thing is so formal, I say. It's this mug contentment. I heard a man once describe such people in this way. He said, they give me the impression that as they go to their church, they're really just paying a morning call on the Almighty. The right and the correct thing to do. And they believe in doing it. Ah, yes, but there's no conception that God may suddenly meet with them and that something tremendous may happen. It isn't the beloved people, shall we examine ourselves? Did you come here this morning expecting something to happen? Do we come to God's house just to listen to a sermon? And to sing our hymns and to meet with one another? How often does this vital idea enter into our minds that we're in the presence of the living God, that the Holy Spirit is in the church, that we may feel the touch of his power? How much do we think in terms of coming together to meet with God and to worship him and to stand before him and to listen to him? Isn't there this appalling danger that we are just content because we have correct beliefs and we've lost the life, the, vit the vital thing, the power, the thing that really makes worship worship, which is in spirit and in truth? Well, there are some of the manifestations of this dead orthodoxy which I have summed up under the general heading of a state of contentment, a smug contentment. But come, let us... Look at it from a slightly different angle. The second characteristic of this dead orthodoxy is, and it follows, of course, directly from the first, a dislike of enthusiasm. Now, this is a most important subject. A dislike of enthusiasm. If you like it in more biblical terms, I could put it like this. It is to be guilty of quenching the spirit because that is exactly the same thing dislike of enthusiasm is to quench the spirit now those who are familiar with the history of the church and in particular with the history of revivals will know that this is the charge of all charges that has always been brought against people who have been most active in a period of revival the charge of enthusiasm some of you may have seen and read the book written by the man who was called the late Father Ronald Knox. He wrote a book, and the title of the book is Enthusiasm. And that is the whole thesis of the book, you see, that uh, you have these periods of enthusiasm, which he regards as aberrations, 
with his cold intellectual detachment, he doesn't like enthusiasm. And as I say, it has been the most common, I suppose, of all the charges that have been brought against people who have been at the center of revival in the church. You read, for instance, these stories of the men of the 18th century. The charge that George Whitfield constantly uh, had to uh, rebut and to reply to at the hand of bishops was this charge of enthusiasm. They said, look here, we're not objecting so much to your doctrine. It's the way you're preaching it. It's the way you're doing it. John Wesley, for instance, was constantly charged even by his own mother, Susanna Wesley, with this same charge of enthusiasm. Why couldn't he preach like everybody else? What was he so excited about? Why all this disturbance? Now, she was a very godly woman, Susanna Wesley. But she couldn't understand this son of hers who'd suddenly become an enthusiast in this way. There's nothing that comes out as you, so clearly as you read the literature of that 18th century in terms of the Christian church than to see this one charge of all charges constantly being brought forward. Well, now then, we've got to look at this subject. Because clearly, this opposition to what is called enthusiasm can be one of the greatest hindrances of all to revival. And it is the particular danger of people who are in a state of dead orthodoxy. I admit freely that it's an extremely difficult subject. That there are certain lines which are very, very difficult to draw. And yet we must do this. We of necessity must. The Bible compels us to, and the history of the church, I say, compels us to do so. And fortunately for us, it is a subject that is dealt with in the Scriptures. And we are not left without some guidance in forming our opinions. Now I read to you that long section from the first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 14, at the beginning, because that is the very subject with which the apostle was dealing there. Now, isn't it interesting to notice this? The apostle had to write along those lines to the church at Corinth. Why was that necessary? Or if I may put my question in a different way, did you feel that that 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians had much to say to us? Did that seem to be a very relevant message to the church of today, even the evangelical church at her best? And I think you'll agree at once that the subject seemed very remote from us and didn't seem to have much to do with us. But isn't that true with so much of the New Testament? And why is that? The answer is quite simple. The New Testament church was a church that was alive. She was filled with the Spirit. She was born in Pentecost, in that great baptism of the Spirit. And there were problems in the early church because she was spiritually alive. That was the problem in the church at Corinth. The problem of the church at Corinth was not the problem of a dead church. It was the problem of a church that had life in it. But because it was young, it was like the life that's in a child. It tended to too much exuberance and it needed to be controlled and to be regulated and disciplined. But we don't know much about that, do we? That doesn't seem to be the problem in the Christian church today. No, no, you see, we've gone right over to the other extreme. And so it is interesting to notice that in the periods of aridity and dryness before revivals, these whole sections of the New Testament seem to be quite irrelevant. But the moment you get a revival, well, then these become the important chapters and you have to go to them at once. Why? Well, because life has come in and you've got the problems of exuberance or excessive manifestations of uncontrolled life and living. So that as we look at the state and the condition today, we must uh, take hold of this teaching to see where we stand. And as I understand the matter, there are two great principles laid down in the New Testament for our help and guidance in this very matter. Now, I say the line is rather difficult to draw, but it's here. There are two positions that we can lay down. Here is the first. Let everything be done decently and in order. There's one position. But there's another position Quench not the Spirit. Now, the, the last, the second quotation is from the first epistle to the Thessalonians, 
chapter 5 and verse 19. Quench not the spirit. All right, here they are. Let everything be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 14, last verse, verse 40. Quench not the spirit. How am I to arrive at a position in between these two? That's the question. Well, now then, let me try and do it like this. Let us uh, look at these two positions which are laid down so clearly in the New Testament and let us see what characterizes each one of them, what can be said under each heading. Well, now look at that first one, let everything be done decently and in order. That is written to people who are guilty of certain things. What, is the, what are they? Well, the first is confusion. There was a great deal of confusion in the church of Corinth. And it arose from the fact that sometimes they were all speaking together. They'd got excited about this question of speaking with tongues. They were not looking at it in a, Christi in a, in a scriptural manner. And they were all speaking at the same time. And then they were prophesying, two or three talking at the same time. And the apostle says, look here, this is quite wrong. God is not the, order, the author of confusion, but of peace. He said if a stranger would come in and suddenly see you all like this, he'd only come to one conclusion. You remember how he puts it? He would say that you are mad. That's no testimony for the gospel. If all are speaking at the same time, and if people don't know how to listen in a controlled manner, why, says the apostle, this is sheer confusion. And the whole gospel is brought into disrepute. He says, look out upon nature and creation. And what you see above everything else is order. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And yet you see there are genuine Christian people who no doubt have had a very real experience and an experience of the power of the Spirit. They almost seem to have got into the condition in which they regard confusion as the hallmark of spirituality. And unless they're all shouting together at the same time, they feel that the Spirit is not present. But it's sheer confusion. And they need to read 1 Corinthians 14 and to observe how the apostle tells them that they must speak one at a time. And if the first man realizes that another brother's got something to say, he must stop and give the second brother the opportunity. But ah, oh, say such people always. We can't help ourselves. It's the spirit that is in us. We can't control ourselves. And then the apostle utters this profound word to them. He says, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So if a man ever tells us that he's so filled with the spirit that he can't contain himself, he must always be shouting. We say, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. And as long as a man can control himself, he must do so. And he must make an effort to do so. There must be no confusion. Confusion always brings the gospel into disrepute. And the second thing I would mention is and it, it comes with that first one, excitement, or a false sense of joy. Now that can be purely of the flesh. There are many things that can excite people. Listen to a broadcast of a football match, and there you'll hear it. Excitement, animal excitement, the shouting, until they lose their very voices in their shout. The excitement that can be, it is entirely of the flesh. Now that can come into the realm of worship and of religion. And again, there are some people who seem to think that this is necessary, and they deliberately work it up, and they try to produce this. They get people into an excited state in which they don't know what they're doing, imagining that they're very happy, but it's of the flesh. It is a false joy. And so the apostle gave that injunction to the members of the church at Corinth that they must do these things properly, one as a psalm, another a spiritual song, and another a word of prophecy, and so on. Let all these things be done and in the right way. Let everything be done decently and in order, says the great apostle. And then the third element is emotionalism. You notice I'm not saying emotion, I'm saying emotionalism. And there is all the difference in the world between those two things. Emotionalism is a state and a condition in which the emotions have run riot. The emotions are in control. They're in a, a kind of ecstasy. And if emotionalism is bad, how much worse is a deliberate attempt to produce it? 
So any effort which deliberately tries to work up the emotions, whether by singing or incantation or anything else, or as you get it in primitive people so often, in various dances and things like that, all this, of course, is just condemned by the New Testament. The mere playing on the emotions is never right. It, 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 it is something which is, I say, condemned right through the Bible. The emotions are to be approached through the understanding, through the mind, by truth. And any direct assault upon the emotions is of necessity false and is inevitably bound to produce trouble. So emotionalism, and especially any artificially produced emotionalism, is undoubtedly a great hindrance to revival because it brings it always into disrepute. Now the history of revivals is most interesting on this very subject with which we are dealing. It's the first charge that is generally brought against a revival. This is not sheer emotionalism. Look at the confusion. This is just animal excitement. These people are besides themselves. This is mass hysteria. That's the charge that always has been brought and always will be brought. And that is why, you see, the New Testament tells us to prove all things and to hold fast only to that which is good. I'm again uh, quoting from 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. The, the same problem was to be found in the church at Thessalonica. Here were people who had been filled with the Spirit, and these things tended to manifest themselves. I hope later to deal with the reason why that tends to happen. I'm merely noting it as a fact at the moment. So the apostle says, look here, prove all things, test the spirits, try them, make sure that this is the Holy Spirit and that it isn't merely the flesh or it isn't the devil working up the flesh to counterfeit the true and thereby to bring the whole thing into disrepute in the eyes of the people. Now there in general, it seems to me, is the interpretation of the injunction, let everything be done decently and in order. Now there is a, an apostolic injunction, and we must hold on to it, come what may. But we must also hold on to the next. Quench not the spirit. What does this mean? Quench not the Spirit. I'm not sure that this isn't the text of all texts that the Church of God speaking generally needs to consider at the present time. We are very clear, are we not, upon that first one? Let everything be done decently and in order? Why, we are experts on it. The trouble is that we are so clear about that that we are guilty of quenching the Spirit. In our reaction from the false, we've gone to another position which is equally false. What do I mean? Well, I mean something like this. Take that uh, fear of confusion, for instance. That is no danger as, we, as far as we are concerned, is it? What is our position? Well, our position is that everything is perfectly controlled. Everything is nice, orderly, correct, formal, and above all, respectable. I just ask you again to take the church as you've known the Christian church and to consider her in the light of the New Testament epistles. You see the difference? You don't need whole tracts of the New Testament today. Why? Well, because the church is in this formal, dead, and utterly respectable position. Now, it's very interesting to observe certain things from the historical standpoint. You will always observe that when forms of service become popular, the spirit is less in evidence and you move further away from the New Testament. The very characteristic of the New Testament church was this spontaneity, this life, this living quality, this vivacity. But as you fall away from the spirit and his influence, everything becomes formal. So you have forms of service you will find that the church in every period of declension becomes much more formal in her service. She adopts forms of service. She tends to turn to liturgy and to ritual. And they like having processions. 
All this is a part of formal religion. But you know, on the other end, every time you get a revival, you find all that kind of thing stopping. You come back to the simplicity of the New Testament. The contrast, if I may put it without being at all offensive, is this, is between a cathedral service and a service by the Lord Jesus Christ sitting in a boat by the lakeside. Are these people meeting in one another's houses in Corinth, Thessalonica, Rome, and everywhere else? That's the contrast. No pomp, no ceremony, no ritual, no processions, no vestments, no dressing up. No, no, but a freedom of the spirit and things happening. And the people singing out of their hearts. That's what you get in every period of awakening and revival. But when the church is not in revival, you get an emphasis upon choirs. And not merely choirs, but paid choirs and paid quartets and soloists in the choir. And the congregation just sits or stands and listens, and the choir even does the singing for them. But the moment you get a revival, the people want to sing themselves. Now, you see, this is the exact opposite, isn't it? This is quenching the spirit. There's no need to say to such people, let everything be done decently and in, and in order. That's their one concern. And haven't you noticed this appalling tendency in the church and the life of the church today, programs have been coming in. Everything is mapped out. I know that up to a point these things have to be done, but surely we are in danger of quenching the spirit. Every item is put down and the time is put by it. A man starts at this point, he ends at another. My friends in the ministry tell me that more and more are they finding this as they go around preaching in different churches from Sunday to Sunday. I'm told now repeatedly that even in evangelical churches, the visiting minister is handed an order of service paper, and literally it is put down before him, 11 o'clock, scripture sentences, and on you go through your list, everything timed, 12 p.m., 12, 12 o'clock noon, benediction. Well, all right, you laugh at that, my friends, but I think it's the most tragic thing that one can conceive of. There is no merit in long sermons as such. God knows there isn't. There is no point in length for the sake of length. But that isn't the question. The question is, are we giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity? Are we so tied by our programs that he's excluded? Why this formality? Why this tying down of everything? What if the Spirit should suddenly come? I do commend this matter to you very seriously. For what it's worth, if it's of any interest to anybody, this is my main reason for not preaching on the wireless. I put it once to one of these religious directors. I asked him this question. I said, what would happen to your programs if the Holy Spirit suddenly came in? And he was man enough and honest enough to admit that really that subject, that question had never entered their minds. Of course not. You're tied to your programs. I can understand it in an official matter like that where you must have your programs. What I'm concerned about is that that element comes into the Christian church. And everything, I say, is thus uh, controlled. It's coming into this country. You've had it for years in the United States of America. Everything to the minute, the technique, the order, it's produced. It, it does indeed remind one, as I was saying last Sunday morning, of some kind of performance put forward. And to the last minute, with a slickness, everything to the second, always at the same point. I ask in the name of God, where is the room for the freedom of the Spirit? No, no, we are controlling our religion, my friends, instead of being controlled by it. And believe me, when a revival comes, we shall experience what has always been experienced. We shall be taken out of time. We'll forget time. We may start our service at the usual time. God alone knows when we'll end it. The freedom of the Spirit. You see, in being afraid of confusion, we can go to the other extreme of quenching the Holy Spirit of God. And then take this question of uh, the fear of a false joy, this artificial excitement and false joy. Now, I say that again, we can be so afraid of that that we can become guilty of quenching the Spirit. I mustn't keep you, so I will put this in the terms of one incident which happened in my own experience. 
On my holidays a few years ago, I went to a church service in a certain place on a Sunday morning. Good congregation, devout people, absolutely orthodox, with a man of God preaching. And his text was, the rainbow in the cloud. Glorious, the rainbow in the cloud. The poor man. That man was so afraid of a false joy that the whole of his sermon was given to the false joy and the dangers of a false peace and a false joy. I'm not criticizing my brother. We are all fallible. But you see, the effect it left upon me was this, that there was nothing there but the cloud and we couldn't see the rainbow. He was so afraid of the false that he quenched the true. We are people of extremes and we swing the pendulum violently. We don't realize that there is this other position where you can avoid the false and have the true. And there are churches that are orthodox but absolutely dead because they're so afraid of the false excitement and the excesses of certain spiritual movements that they quench and hinder the spirit and deny the true. And my last point is this that in our fear of emotionalism there is a grave danger of our banishing emotion altogether. I am troubled at the absence of emotion in the Christian church today. Oh, there's plenty of sentiment, but I'm not talking about sentiment. Sentiment is weak and flabby. Sentiment is that which a hard man puts on to persuade himself that he's still got some feeling within him. No, no, we don't want sentiment. Sickly, maudling sentiment. We want emotion, that God-given quality. But oh, how little emotion there is today. When did you last hear of a person weeping because of his sinfulness? When did you last weep yourself because of your distance from God? We've forgotten how to weep, my friends. When did you last hear of a person weeping for joy? Weeping out of sheer joy in the sense of the glory of God. No, no, we are afraid of emotion. Our whole training and upbringing, the whole attitude to life is one that curbs the emotion. We feel it isn't gentlemanly. We feel it isn't quite respectable. It isn't nice. We are stealing the emotions, curbing this God-given thing. It's true of all branches of life today. It's the blight that is upon the whole of life. That's why you've no longer got great preaching. You haven't got great statesmen. You haven't got great speakers. I'm told that in the House of Commons they all read their speeches. You've no longer got your men who can move the congregation, move the people, and lead to some vital decisions. No, no, everything is so controlled. Emotion is ousted. Eloquence is distrusted. So you don't have great preaching. You don't have great speaking. You don't have great acting. You don't have great anything. Everything is just conversational, and casual. And you mustn't have fervor. And you mustn't be moved. And you mustn't allow anybody to move you. And nobody must be moved at all. Everything must be a quiet statement. You must even talk about the cross of Christ quietly. You must speak about the glory of the Lord and being filled with the Spirit quietly with an absence of emotion. We are so afraid of emotionalism that there's an absence of a true and a healthy and a God-given emotion amongst us. What is it all due to? I believe it is due to a pseudo-intellectualism and a false sense of what is respectable. I am profoundly convinced that this is perhaps the greatest of all hindrances to revival. You see, we pride ourselves in our learning. We say, of course, our forefathers, they had revivals because they lacked our control and our discipline. They were not educated as we are. They were not really gentlemen. They were crude. They were primitive. And so you can still get your revivals among such people, but not amongst us. We are intellectual. God have mercy upon us. One of the greatest intellects that this world has ever known was the Apostle Paul. But as I'm never tired of pointing out to you and reminding you, look at him as he's moved by a grand sweep of emotion. He starts off on a point, but suddenly he names Christ and he's lost. He forgets what he was saying and he bursts out into his magnificent eloquence. And then he 
comes back to his point again. Disorder, if you like, inconsinities, anachalutha, use your terms. Yes, but it's the glory of the man, this giant intellect, but who was moved by the truth, moved to tears. That's the trouble with all of us. I read of George Whitfield preaching, and as he was preaching about the glories of grace and of salvation, the tears were pouring down his cheeks, and those who listened to them were equally weeping. It's true of all these men, and you and I are so hard and so intellectual and so controlled. This isn't a plea for emotionalism. I've denounced it. It's a plea for emotion. God save us from being so afraid of the false and of emotionalism that we quench the Spirit of God and become so respectable and so pseudo-intellectual that the Spirit of God is kept back and we go on in our dryness and aridity and in our comparative futility and helplessness and uselessness. Oh, let us consider these two great propositions of the New Testament. Let everything be done decently and in order, certainly. But in the name of God, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, and let us come to God's house in freedom, ever expecting the power to descend upon us and to have experiences of God and of Christ that will melt us and move us and break us and make us forget ourselves. and approximate a little more closely to the church as she is described and depicted in the pages of the New Testament. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesies, but at the same time prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.